if we've got a, a 10 foot wide gap in that ditch and you've got good brushy cover coming all the way into it, I can put a shooter either right there or on the downwind side of that 10 feet. Mm-hmm. But where I cross over that, where my boot tracks go through that cover, I almost use that as a bait pile for them. What's up, everybody? We have got an exciting one for you here today, and it's part of our pod venture where Mark and I are going to be likely heading west to be calling for some coyotes and uh, doing a little bit of predator hunting here. And we're very excited, not only for that hunt, but because actually in our, uh, you know, as, as you know, a lot of times we'll discuss having a little podcast before the podcast at times. Matt McHugh across the table from us is probably, when it comes to coyotes, in terms of, I don't know, people I've met, most interesting coyote dude. Very, in the world. In, in a variety of, of facets of that world. Matt's in deep. He's, oh, he's into the oh, coyote yeah. hunting pretty deep, Jim. Oh, that's <laughs> that's for sure. So um, he's going to learn us a little bit on, on a number of different things uh, related to calling and some tactics and understanding getting into the mind of the coyotes that, were, uh, that are out there. See, I'm starting to say coyotes instead of coyotes now. I, I was going to comment. I've, I'm so... Uh, I don't know if you can see the chills, Jim, but hearing be, you call them coyotes is... I used to be coyote. I didn't even know you could say it any other way than coyote. We should add, so now we're on the subject, because Matt, you're, you're a Wisconsin, yeah. uh, Wisconsinite, so you, do you say coyotes, coyotes, a lot of coyotes around here, a lot of E's on it. Yeah. Uh, I, I trend toward coyote. Um, I, I do still trip up a little bit and call it coyote <laughs> myself, but I do trend toward coyote, and uh, you know, I, it's a holdover from Dustin's episode with you guys on the coyote-coyote debate, whatever, <laughs> but... Um, yeah, I mean, it. in my experience, it's, you know, a Midwest thing for the most part that it is coyote. Um, I, I, well, East Coast as well. Yeah. East Coast. I feel like, so, for, and from what I've heard, and we, I think we talked about this on that, on that episode with Dustin as well, I think actually coyote is correct. Oh. I think it's actually, I think that is like the more correct ver- way to say it, but I still can't. I don't know. Like, there's it's only, just it's regional, like you said. It's where I grew up. And they're coyotes. I tell you what. When it comes to the movie, there's only one way to say it. It's coyote ugly. You can't say coyote ugly. <laughs> that's true. Anyway, I'll just throw that out there. I'll grant you there. that. I'll grant <laughs> that's you that. the that's the barometer right yeah. there. That's yeah. the measuring stick of how you should pronounce it. Um. So, Matt, there's a lot to go into as far as just you uh, yourself, and and we'll have to have you intro yourself to everybody out there. So, uh, why don't you take it away and uh, tell the people listening who you are. And uh, then they can get a sense of, of uh, yeah, how interesting it gets. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, I'm Matt McHugh. I'm from northeast Wisconsin. Um, grew up night hunting. Fell in love with the, uh, the natural world in the dark and the activity level that I see out there with the critters. And um, have always been really drawn to that. Been a night owl by, by nature for a long, long time. Um, but I... Uh, Pursued it a little bit through college, Um, got a degree in wildlife ecology for the purpose of research and management, spent a lot of time out in the woods doing some vocalization surveys um, for population counts and had a lot of fun with that. Learned a bit about the animals in that process, but then I've always just wanted to know why. Um, You know, so when I would go out and set up on a stand and get busted or not see anything, it pushed me to go out and find out why. So I'd get up and walk the perimeter of the property I had permission on, look for tracks, see where they came in from, um, how they got the best of me, be humbled, learn and move on and, and, and build off of that. And uh, it pushed my calling a ways, it pushed the understanding a ways um, to this point now. Um, I'm a guide here in Wisconsin for uh, predator calling specialize in in hunting after dark but uh pretty well versed in all aspects of the the coyote hunting stuff um be it with hounds or um trapping daytime calling all that kind of stuff but uh anyway uh it's a deep deep seated passion of mine um i'm out 150 days a year better or nights a year um nice. getting after them so a lot of it's nuisance calls and things like that but you know for the most part it's just the enjoyment of being out there. Right on. Yeah. Very cool. I noticed you've got some pretty sweet artwork on your arm there, and I think I, I yeah. take that as a, another indicator <laughs> of uh, how passionate Matt is about yeah. chasing coyotes. Yeah, so this, this is the front pad of a rather large coyote, and this would be the rear pad of a rather large coyote. Um, and 
for good reference. It's also good for, for conversations when people up here in Wisconsin are concerned about wolves and they found a track and, oh, man, it was this big. And uh, you know, How was it in comparison to this thing on my arm? <laughs> this is a big coyote. How does it compare to that? Um, so, you know, and there's a lot of barstool biology, we'll say, that, that comes into play with some of that stuff. And um, it helps to ease people's mind a little bit to know that maybe they don't have wolves in their area or – it's a neat thing for them to know that they have wolves in their area or maybe there's a, a loose domestic dog running around and, and things like that. So to help kind of clear up some of those misconceptions and, um, you know, the trail camera pictures I get sent on the daily, um, you know, what is it? What is it? Um, <laughs> you know. You yourself, you've actually printed yourself into a field guide. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's, yeah. What, that's what you are now. Yeah. <laughs> Just, it's, it's, it's quick reference. You, know, you look down like it. Oh, yeah, that's one. So, <laughs> in case I forget. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in in addition to, you know, hunting them yourself so much, a, you guide, and I think you mentioned um, you've done you done tournament calling and all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's also this uh, this organization or group that's pretty unique to Wisconsin that you were telling us a little bit about as well that you're a part of. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah. So, um, you know, Wisconsin is unique with our, uh, our Department of Natural Resources and um, changing rules and regulations in that as citizens, you're able to write a resolution and pass it up the line, pass it up the chain to try to affect some change. And when rules, when rule changes come about, um, ideally that's where they have originated from. So um, one of the things that drove me was my passion for night hunting. And uh, you had mentioned it earlier, uh, you know, pre-show here about the use of lights at night here in Wisconsin being point of kill only. Um, mm-hmm. you know, that was one thing that I had some, uh, some qualms about. And wanted to get some clarification on it or to absolve it or, you know, figure out a better way to word that. Um, and you know, that's kind of what got me started on that path. And, uh, you know, also the the views and uh, my beliefs expressed in this podcast uh, in and around the Conservation Congress are mine and mine alone and don't, uh, don't reflect the views of the collective uh, Wisconsin Conservation Congress, of course. But, um, you know, for someone that wants to get involved, wants to see some change, uh, would like to help with clarifications on a rule or to help with a change that would benefit them, their peers, their um, local landowners, the you know anything around them, regardless if it's fishing or kayaking or uh, motorized recreational vehicle trails or whatever. Um, that's the proper path for those things to get done. Um, so I encourage everybody in your area, go to your local spring hearings and uh, and get engaged. Maybe even become a, a county delegate. And then beyond that, there's uh, there's all kinds of committees. There's a wolf committee, a warm water committee, bear committee. Uh, I sit on the fur harvest committee as well. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can get engaged and certainly encourage folks to do that. Um, yeah, very cool. Because I mm-hmm. think every state that I've lived in, when you hunt, coyotes at night you can use artificial light mm-hmm. i guess you know prior to just the point of kill and i guess in some ways just so i'm i haven't actually i actually haven't night hunted wisconsin God, we're gonna get because we're gonna do another podcast on night hunting gyms now we're getting specific to it yes so i don't want to brief be, aside here brief aside here but anyway so i, I just feel like Sidebar, um, i think that's what it's not it. it's not, it wouldn't be like a unique thing if you allowed that here you know it, it'd oh, be yeah. like you know it's kind of it's common practice you know with your um with your background in, in, in wildlife ecology and um, just your, your natural interest and passion for learning about coyotes, what's going on with that? You hear a lot about, like, predator management, you know, and, mm-hmm. and you know, so what's going on, I guess, with that um, and also, I guess, the biology of, of the coyote? Because I've, I've heard a, a couple different things as far as, like, uh, you know, they have, a, I guess, a unique um, – they're unique in that – they can sense, I guess, the population of uh, you know their their general area, and I mean, is that is that true? Where like if they're if the density or the carrying capacity can hold more coyotes, the female will actually have more pups, mm-hmm. or what's going on there? Yeah, so um, you know, as far as the to touch on the predator management side of things, and then also harken back to the carrying capacity piece, there are a lot of different schools of thought out there. Um, you know, typically as callers, we're working on private landowner permission. Um, there are a lot of guys that dabble out there on the public too, but we're out there 
primarily on on private landowners permission and we're out there at their behest so if they're having issues with their predators or if that piece of property is their utopia that they want to grow their deer on or they want to grow mm-hmm. pheasants on or turkeys on or sheep or chickens or whatever it is um you know that's their garden so you know they're reaching out to us via word of mouth or you know facebook advertisements or whatever's out there um to have us come in and pull the weeds that are competing for them to grow their garden mm-hmm. and um depending on how rich that area is the problems might be more widespread um they might think it's a coyote problem they might think it's a wolf problem and it could be a fox problem it could be a coon problem Hmm. um so coming in uh to a situation like that you want to you know kind of build an understanding for what they've got going on there um but beyond that uh to touch on the carrying capacity piece um we have to remove at least 70% of the local coyote population to have an indent in the population the following year. Wow. And Whoa, that is significant. It is. It is. And via calling means it's not likely to happen at a 70% rate locally. Mm-hmm. Um, hounding can push things a little bit closer, but again, you know, they're not likely going to get them all either. Trappers have the potential, but probably won't get them all. Um, and then you have the fluidity of coyotes across the landscape in this territorial dispute stuff that we were talking about earlier too, um, where they're, they're constantly pushing on each other for territorial boundaries and for, um, rich pockets of prey and rich Mm -hmm. pockets of cover and things in their area. So that fluidity can change that percentage locally that you're taking too. So, um, you know, if you are removing 70% of the local population of adults or 70% of the local population, um, that's a pretty good dent at that time. Now, if that happens in the winter, when the fur is prime, uh, when trappers are out, when callers are primarily out, when the hound guys are out, there's snow on the ground and things like that, um, that's going to decrease that predator population, in turn increasing the prey population, allowing the survivors to carry better through the winter, oh, healthier. Right. And um, Less competition. Right. So, you know, we see that even when we're, when we're skinning coyotes or raccoons or whatever, that mammalian health is measured in fat across the back or in the color of the bone marrow and, um, you know, those those kinds of things that you can look at on the carcass to say, you know, this is a pretty good area for these coyotes right now. Um, we had a lot of coyote activity here and, you know, when I was out after dark with the thermal scope, I saw mice and voles and stuff running around all over the place. They're, they're doing well. Um, but you know, through the winter, if that predator population is down, the prey population is up, the female's carrying better through that 61 day gestation period. She's likely going to whelp more viable pups on the backside of that. Okay. Rare them to maturity without having to, we'll say snuff out a runt, um, due to resources being tight. Mm Mm-hmm. She's also not going to be getting pushed on and bumped into constantly in territorial disputes because there's fewer predators to cover that landscape. Hmm. So, you know, in a way, depending on how you look at it, we are providing a better future for pups when we go in there and take animals in the wintertime. Um, And then, depending on what your motivations are in predator control, the springtime can be the best time to go out there and remove animals um, in that you may be getting multiple animals per carcass. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. If your motivations are to cleanse the landscape of predators so that your pheasants can, you know, that your pheasants that you're planting can make it, um, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of different ways to look at that predator management piece, but as a whole, when we're talking about the the private landscape or the you know, just the cover types all the way across Wisconsin. We're not typically removing 70% of the local population. Right. Um, beyond that, then, what we do in fur harvest is as sustainable a practice as you can imagine. You know, we're not at all going to affect the population the coming year. If anything, it may grow. It's not likely to grow as a result of hunting pressure, but it's going to, to grow. Um, and coyotes to this part of the country haven't been haven't been here all that long, you know, 30, 40 years that we've had coyotes prevalent on the landscape. And with that, then we, we don't know what their population would balloon to. 
Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I guess I didn't realize that that was such a young, you know, thing in in our history here, as far as like either. having or not having coyotes. And man, that's such a c- interesting point too. Of like, depending on what your your quote management goals are, mm-hmm. kind of depends on how you maybe view those coyotes and and when you want to be hunting them. You know, if if you're putting up a bunch of fur, you know, I mean, that's ideal, man. You're you're knocking down dogs, you know, when they're furred up first prime you're going to get the most the most for that that hide and then like you said but it's it's actually kind of like a a a net neutral or just a positive as far as you know the population so Mm -hmm. um and then i guess you know um conversely if you're trying to actively reduce that population that to a significant level where it may have uh you know a positive impact on other species i guess Hmm. you know you take them take them a little bit later in the year yeah. Yep. And seasonally, locally, you can cleanse a property. Whereas in the in the winter time, that's very difficult. You know, it's the the coyote breeding season is on. Um, you have transient males and bachelor groups and all kinds of things that are running around, and then mated pairs running around as well, until after the breeding season, where they select a piece of dirt, call it theirs, dig their heels in prepared a den there and then there's not a lot of fluidity and at that time okay. really the only fluidity you have are those bachelor groups and those transient males for that period so if you would go in seasonally and remove predators in the spring for fawn protection or for turkey poults or whatever it is that you're looking to preserve on that that piece of property you can pretty well cleanse it for a couple of months Interesting. And give yeah. and give those other game species a chance to get ahead. Okay. Right. Yeah. You're talking about turkey poults in in the spring there, mm-hmm. or or fawns. You know. I mean, that's when they are most susceptible. Yep. And if and if if you kind of have that core area of coyotes that are on that piece, and yep, ones aren't coming in, these guys aren't leaving. You can have you know that impact. Mm-hmm. Huh. Well, yeah. and that's and that's on the game species side. Right. But if it's a uh, a free range chicken farmer, you know, that's that's a problem too. And you can clear things up for him for a bit there. Um if they're raising sheep or raising cattle or whatever, um, you know, you can do them some good in that time frame as well. Mm-hmm. Outside of that couple, three, four month window they're they're pretty fluid. Mm-hmm. So you were mentioning um, you know, in regards to that winter time when they're in their breeding season and they're really moving around, you have mm-hmm. a lot of just uh, as fluidity, like you said, within um, the coyote population. Now, I have to imagine, you know, basically, that's like the coyote rut, mm-hmm. right? And so that's when people are out there the most. That's probably when you mentioned that a lot of uh, coyotes are constantly in these territorial disputes. Now, does that happen a lot more during that time of year then? And is that mm-hmm. why then calling can be so effective? And is the calling, um, you know, I, I found it pretty interesting when you were saying, uh, earlier on, um, that like a lot of calling that you end up doing winds up triggering a territorial response in a coyote more so than just like an, I'm hungry. That sounds like good food response. Yep. So, yeah. And you know, the, the time of year can dictate some of that as well, but depending on where you're calling and what part of the country you're in, um, you know, certainly some of the Western states, if it's desert or if it's corn stubble desert or bean stubble desert or wheat stubble desert, um, your prey populations might not be to the same level that they are in this part of Wisconsin, where mm-hmm. we've got a lot of topography, we've got a lot of cover, we've got a lot of set-aside and um, erosion control, CRP, um, there's a lot of food out there for them available. So knowing the animals in your area and what's you know what's going to drive them helps. Um, but it's really dependent on on those areas you know if you go down to texas or you go to um you know one of the wheat stubble deserts i was talking about out west or whatever those kinds of things for the most part if you're blowing on a prey distress if they got ears they're coming in a lot of instances Mm -hmm. um and you're gonna pull in a lot of the uneducated coyotes or the, the fresh coyotes that haven't seen callers before um or just aren't wary to man and that kind of thing um and you'll get a lot of really aggressive responses to the call. And 
they make for quick stands, they make for very exciting stands, but when you start to play that chess game with them of the territorial dispute and how they're going to respond to that, that's where it gets really interesting for me. Mm -hmm. So I use a prey distress call in this part of the country for a very different purpose. And when I go out on a stand, I want to introduce myself as a, a strange coyote to elicit that territorial response. Beyond that, then, whether they respond back with a challenge howl to say, get out of here, this is my turf, um, or they say, in the case of breeding season, hang on, sweetie, I'll be right there. Um, mm -hmm. Either way, or if they don't say anything and they want to use the element of surprise to come in, um, I use that prey distress sound as a placeholder. So it gives okay. them a focal point to come in and make their circle and keep their attention drawn to that spot. And if you are sneaking in on something, but you don't know where it is, you don't hear anything, you can't smell anything, and potentially that something you're sneaking up on could bite you. Yeah. Um, you're going to be a little bit more careful and cautious. And when you're thinking like a coyote, in, in that situation, they might be belly crawling up a ditch for 300 yards, poking their head up, trying to see something or smell something. Um, if you play a sound and sit quiet for 10 minutes and see what happens, they don't know where it is or where the animal is or what's on top of it or, you know, whatever. So I like to keep my sounds moving um, throughout the whole stand and stay pretty active with my sounds so they, don't ever, they never have to throw anything to chance. They know exactly where it is, what they're coming mm -hmm. into. They have that confidence and then provide them with cover to make their approach and feel like they're a fly on the wall coming in to check it out um, and do everything kind of in front of them not directly challenging them, and I can get into that a little bit later, but that prey distress sound is now the spot where that strange coyote is. It's mm -hmm. on top of that woodpecker in the fence row. It's on top of that rabbit out in the field. It's on top of, you know, a, a fox or a coon or a barn cat or whatever you're using out there for a prey distress sound. They now know exactly where that animal is, and that's distracted. So that boosts their confidence to a level that they can come wheeling right in on it, either it. directly at the call or circling around to the downwind side and um, and trying to figure out how they're going to play that territorial response. Gotcha. So, and then, so, you know, we're talking e-callers here, right? So you're talking like a, a caller with a remote where you're playing that sound? Mm -hmm. in that that, or you just like go in your own library of, you know, mouth <laughs> calls that you can just make. Oh, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, um, we'll have to get into that in a little bit, for sure. Right. So I guess we're, our, what I thought I was understanding was that you're, you know, playing that sound there and then kind of going, going downwind and kind of setting up you know, anticipating they're going to, you know, come downwind, use that, you know, use all the topography and the wind and everything to their advantage as they make that approach. Is that what you're doing or sometimes is what you said? or It's it's a sometimes thing. And that's the beauty of this sport is that you can make it whatever you want it to be. And there are some folks out there that like to lay on frozen dirt under a white sheet with a, a rabbit call in their mouth and see if they can get them to break cover and get a shot at them. Um, if you're buddy hunting, you might be blowing a hand call or natural voicing or whatever, or using an electronic caller um, and setting your buddy up to be that downwinder in the travel corridor or that downwinder, um, you know, with them coming up the bottom of the draw or whatever to try to get around you. So, you know, you can, you can build that out however you like. And there's a thousand different ways to skin this cat. And what I do isn't necessarily gospel, but there's a lot of things that I do tied to natural history of the animal that work really well for me um and, and i find you know i'm i'm learning how to better those techniques all the time and uh, and pick those things up but when i've got a sound stimulus out in the field whether it's myself or my buddy or an electronic caller or i just happen upon an owl on top of a rabbit out there in the field uh they're likely going to circle downwind of that Mm -hmm. So, you know, like you had said, kind of giving them that cover to feel comfortable coming in is another confidence booster for them. If they don't have to run across a, a wide open lit field in the daytime or even on a full moon, um, they're tending to the edges. So they're going to stick to those fence rows and ditches and draws and uh, CRP and 
a grass strip that might only be this wide or you know a bit of the a bit of the field that got missed by the chopper or whatever um, something there that they're using as a as a terrain feature to hide themselves or feel a little more comfortable or confident coming up um, but I build the stand off of a piece of cover like that okay okay yeah so if I've got the wind coming from Jim to myself I would set the call up um, such that if the coyotes are working the edge of this field, let's say this is a field and the coyotes are going to work the edge of the field, um, I want to be prepared to take them before they get to the wind off of the collar out here in the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, but give them all of the edge of this field to feel comfortable in or come underneath in the ditch and never see them until they get to right here and pop up. But playing that chess game, if you know they're going to stop here, this is they're either going to end up on the call or they're going to end up here you you really want to make sure that you can cover this right Mm -hmm. so if you're by yourself that changes the game a little bit if you're with a buddy that allows you to do some of that stuff if if you are by yourself and you have a gap in that fence or a gap in that travel corridor make that your point in the middle of your downwind scent cone let it blow that way so they're going to end up there and you're going to have an opportunity Um, and you haven't got to see the whole world but you've got to see the call and you've got to see that downwind pinch point on that travel corridor so that allows you to take you know two three square miles that your sound is reaching out to and funnel it into a foot and a half wide crick Mm -hmm. okay and set an x right in the crick that's Mm -hmm. i mean yeah because i guess if you if you use the wind to draw a line from that call Mm -hmm just downwind they're going to intersect probably wherever the cover intersects that line is is your little square yep. spot that you're talking about and if you can cover that mm-hmm. and the idea is that you you would cover that obviously without having their natural corridor at least that you that you presume that they'll be taking have your scent in it so you're mm-hmm. somewhere else where your scent will be sort of removed from the equation yep okay and so when I first uh, got into guiding and, and really got into night hunting, uh, did a lot of it with shotguns on spots just like that where, um, you know, we can use the lights here in Wisconsin, but only at the point of kill. So you dig deep enough into the wildlife management statutes on that. It says you've got to identify the animal to a species in open season before you turn on your light. Um, so you've got to be on top of them um, mm-hmm. to be able to make that determination. And what I would do is walk into the wind through a spot on that travel corridor that was going to be optimum for us to be able to harvest that animal when they came in. And it's typically going to be a pretty quick encounter. Um, Coyotes don't sit still very long as a rule. But if we've got a a 10-foot wide gap in that ditch or the fence row or there's a culvert there or whatever, a tractor path that goes over the top of it, and they've got good brushy cover coming all the way into it, I can put a shooter either right there or on the downwind side of that 10 feet mm-hmm. but where i cross over that and where my boot tracks go through that cover i almost use that as a bait pile for them um it's a a call lure kind of thing where they come burning in there and set up your sound stimulus or go far enough and call for your buddy that they feel comfortable making that burn into that travel corridor and then as they're circling around downwind they crossed my boot tracks where I crossed in that optimal spot right in the middle of that gap to provide the best possible opportunity they're going to lock up for a second stick their nose in my boot track and decide that's not where they want to be turn and burn but that gives you two three four seconds to see them come in say definitely a coyote light on safety off coyote oh okay it's like the uh, yeah the smell version of uh you know bleating out a deer to get it to stop yeah it's a bold it's a bold move or the old meh Right. It's a bold move, mm-hmm. but you know, because a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want them to smell me at all or anything like that. But to just walk right through that spot or put a boot track in that spot where you're like, well, this is where it's going to happen. But it, I can see how that would be effective. Yeah, just yep. get them to stop long enough. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, it looks uh, from the sounds of it, you've got a pretty tight shooting lane. And like mm-hmm. I said, cows, they don't sit still for long, they move pretty quick. If they pop through there, yep. you're just not going to get that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. And, and you haven't got to see. For 400 yards in every direction mm-hmm. you know i'm out here by the caller or doing the calling myself with likely a shotgun um and if there's a really aggressive coyote that wants to come straight to the call or 
a non-educated coyote that wants to come straight to the call, I'm prepared for that. Mm -hmm. But I'm building that stand and that little chessboard scenario off of the response of a call shy coyote and what they're going to end up doing. Mm -hmm. So it's not that they can't circle on another fence row back another 400 yards and still downwind you because they can. Mm -hmm. Or they could be on the other side of the blacktop or the other side of the gravel road and smell you and bust you and booger out of there and even tell the rest of the coyotes with an earshot that you're there. But when you're playing the game of odds, you're likely going to draw them into that first downwind travel corridor. And if you set up 30 yards from that with your caller, that's likely going to bump them to the next one or bump them out of that fence row back over here to spin them wider. Um, but if you give them all of the things that they see as ideal when making that approach, uh, yeah. they're going to be pretty comfortable making that swing. And it's another thing, too, to... Uh, to talk about using terrain to your advantage. Um, coyotes will quite often come in on high ground to be able to see something, sure. especially if the wind isn't ideal for them. So if we've got a calm wind or a swirling wind or a really big wind, um, they might well take the high ground. Um, but they're typically going to favor a downwind side if they can. So with those pieces of knowledge alone, if you find high ground that you can set up downwind of and still capitalize on an animal approaching to that high ground or beyond that high ground yourself and wait for them, put high ground downwind, that's where they're going. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're creating those ideal circumstances for them, making them feel comfortable, and you're not going to surprise them as they're coming through the, the terrain with a terrain feature. I mean, you're in their kitchen. They know every tuft of grass and fence, pro fence post and you know, twig out there, they, they know it on the sure. ground, on the ground level, they know it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. So they use it well. And for us to compete, we need to as well. Nothing more crafty than the coyote, Jim. They are crafty. It's tough to buggers. be crafty er. You know, I mean, I mm -hmm. think anybody that's hunted coyotes, and I think that's probably why I would, I would speculate that's part of why you're so into it and why you grew to love it so much is because it's so dang hard and they are so smart and they're so mm -hmm. good at surviving. They're yep. tough to get. Yep. It's a very challenging critter to, to get after consistently. Now, um, so a lot of the stuff you are mentioning there, I think we we're you are talking about working in an area where there's a lot of those territorial disputes and where you're not necessarily going to be in a wide open spot where the coyotes are pretty hungry and, and just bombing into a call. So in our case, we're thinking about, like we said, probably going heading out west somewhere mm -hmm. In the realm of Nebraska, you got your South Dakotas, your Wyoming's of the world, somewhere in that region. Um, what kind of stuff are you seeing there? I, I know I've I've been to hunting in Nebraska once, been through it numerous times. There mm -hmm. are certainly parts of it where are wide open or whatever, and in and all those states in there, wide open, very flat land. Although you see a lot of coyotes off the highway when you <laughs> when you go through those areas. Um, and then sometimes there are some sort of breaky country with your different topography and, and whatnot. So what what should we should we be expecting to play more of the territorial game? Or I, obviously it'll depend on what it looks like. Or if we are going to end up in an area where there are going to be, you know, it's more your uh, your flat, not a lot going on, um, more plainsy area. What what should we be expecting to encounter there? Well, Does that makes sense. <laughs> as far as the difference between. Um those types of ground and everything in between, you know, whether it's badlands type country or it's grasslands or pastures or um, whatever that you're working on out there, you see coyotes out there, mm -hmm. they're there. So it's not that you need to shy away from any one thing or the other, but the ground that you're hunting, again, is their kitchen. So um, keep that in mind. And if you are hunting thicker terrain or more rugged or breaky terrain, um, that kind of stuff will typically lend you to shorter walks going right. into a stand. Um, whereas a, a big wide open expanse where you can see for a mile, they can see for a mile. Mm -hmm. And when coyotes are out there loafing in the middle of the day or in the, you know, in the morning hours, they might be out running around mousing yet or in the evening hours running around mousing. Um, and depending on their activity level throughout the day, they might be on their feet. But if they're not on their feet and they are laid up someplace loafing, there's a decent chance that they are in a position to be able to observe the landscape mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or a decent chance that they're in a position to be able to smell the landscape. Makes sense. So, you know, bear that in mind if you've got a shelter belt or something that you want to set up on. Um, 
do your best to try to find a spot where you can park the truck out of the way and walk in utilizing a low spot in the terrain to your advantage um, and try to get into position without them busting you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in some of those places out west, how, how often to a coyote does a pickup truck come rolling down that quarter line road? Every time somebody pops out and blows a jackrabbit call. Right. <laughs> right. 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 So, um, especially in the wintertime. So, and yeah. that's probably how a lot of people think it works based on some of the descriptions you get where they're like, oh, yeah, you just go out west and you start hammering on some call that sounds like a dead animal and they just come flying in. You shoot as many as you can and <laughs> you head home. Yep. It's simple, Jim. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, and what gets folks hooked is that it can be that simple. Sure. Mm hmm. Um, is it going to be every time? No. Um, and to try to get consistent success with it, you've got to break it down to a level much further than that. Mm -hmm. um, but what gets a lot of people into the sport and that it's a really you know quick growing sport is when you get out and you set up on some of those un uneducated coyotes and it's the first time that they've heard an artificial uh, dying rabbit mm -hmm. and you've got them hook, line, and sinker. Yeah, they've got no reason to believe that's not. Right. Yeah what yeah. they think it is yeah so you know then beyond that it's uh you know some of those encounters again that get folks hooked and then um get them out there trying it and the first time they did it they plopped down on a rock pile and they blew on a hand call and a coyote came running in and they shot it so they go back out to that same rock pile every weekend <laughs> and <laughs> plop, on the plop same down call. and blow on the same call and expect it to happen again and it's not that it won't ever happen again but they're likely to call in 20 coyotes without seeing without seeing them interesting hmm. um and especially if there was a survivor out of that initial pair that came in or the initial triple or quad that came in and how many did you see that when when you called in how many hung back another 400 yards um and got to experience all of that and mm -hmm. learn learn from that behavior um so yeah how many how many got downwind that you didn't see that went mm -hmm. hmm, yeah that's not good right or just Sat back 400 yards and said, mm, we'll see what happens, and then heard the pickup fire up and saw you drive away. Um, so the old Earl didn't come back. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Festus didn't make it home. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's uh, there's a lot of pieces, you know, that get brought in when you're setting up um, daytime out in, out in open country. Mm -hmm. um, and even, even around here. Uh, so in the... The topography that you've got around here. Uh, I'm going to be guiding again this weekend down in Buffalo County. Um, some of those spots, now, those coyotes are going to sit ready to engage the prevailing wind for the majority of the day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for the guys that want to walk in and set up on the bottom and call, you've got to be pretty with it. They're likely going to be at the transition area loafing from the top to the bottom or be able to see you're in a position where they can smell that wind swirling up into those draws and up into those valleys and it might behoove you to sit up on the top and let the wind blow true be able to come in off the road and walk yourself out a couple few hundred yards out into a field set up let the wind blow true and build a stand scenario on a top versus going down into a bottom and letting your wind swirl around and likely make it into their noses before they commit Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, because when you get in those uh, in those bottoms, like you said, that wind is so unpredictable. It's swirling. It's all over the place. I mean, yep. I, I've deer hunted some spots like that, and it actually had success. But I mean, you're you're rolling the dice. Yep. And so I see what you're saying about getting to a little bit higher ground where that wind is just going to be more consistent, more true, and you can kind of depend on. Mm -hmm that going a specific direction do you also then have the chance if you're up high then that you might start on a calling sequence or something and they might just be right right there next to you or oh yeah so yep and or that you being up high you'll be able to disseminate your sound to the bottom and be able to draw them from those places um without them being aware of your presence as your wind is you know staying over the top of them hmm. um do they bed kind of like a deer like let's say there's a prevailing wind where they'll they'll bed where they can see with the wind at their back and so they're kind of trusting their their nose as their eyes behind them and and looking down at everything or not necessarily not necessarily okay. um i i find that and you know gravel pits are a perfect example for some of the stuff up by me where um you know guys hear coyotes in the gravel pit all the time right and i can 
about bet when you walk in that if you look to the east side of that, somewhere along that edge, there's a hole. Or, you know, later on we get into the night hunting stuff using the thermal scopes and looking at that bank with my scanner mm -hmm. to be able to pick out dens in the side of that mm. gravel pit on the east side, catching every bit of the prevailing wind wrapping around that gravel pit. They're mm -hmm. able to effortlessly take in every piece of information in that pit. Mm -hmm. Whether it's somebody rolling in, somebody walking in, people down there working, um, you know, a strange male coming up over the wall, working the rim, a bobcat, fox, rabbit, whatever. They're able to draw all that without moving and being mm -hmm. very efficient. So, um, you know, look for that kind of stuff um, as far as places where they're going to hang out. Uh, they like to be able to see, but smell is a huge thing for them. Gotcha. We were talking a little bit earlier about, you know, time of year, the breeding season what, what would you say is in general it's probably going to depend regionally you know maybe how north or south you are things like that but mm -hmm. you, you know i guess we're and we're kind of speaking specifically to like the midwest and the west here you know nebraska south dakota uh you know eastern montana things like that what what is that breeding season time frame where the dogs are starting to you know get paired up you know they are being territorial trying to sort things out I would say that's, uh, you know, mid-January on through February. Okay, mid-January through February. Okay. And then you, I often times with that here about hides, like, oh, man, you know, you get into February, the, the, they're breeding, you know, the, the hide quality is going to decline. Is that is that happening? It, it does, but it's not necessarily a function of breeding or breeding activities. Uh, right. So... A lot of it is just, you know, the, the guard hairs come in and, you know, some of the western coyotes that I just shot, we had some early ice out there evidently. Um, we didn't have ice while we were there, but had some, some early freezing and, uh, and snow and some hoarfrost and things like that. But okay. when they lay down right. and get back up, they're thawing and then the stuff freezes around them and whatever. When they go to stand back up, they're breaking guard hairs off. Okay. Or they're ducking under more barbed wire fences with that winter coat on late in the winter. You're going to see some more damage there. They're crawling oh. through more rock piles, or they're digging more holes and climbing it's just in more burrows. More time to get beat up. Exactly. Okay. It's just wear and tear, Jim. Yep. Classic. Interesting. So, I guess in regard to that breeding season and sounds, it sounds like you use a lot of vocalization or coyote vocalizations as well as distress sounds. How do you break that down? Are you using more coyote vocalizations during that breeding season? Not necessarily. Okay. Um, and so, you know, part of that is thinking like a coyote. So if I've got, if I've got a lady with me and she's in season, um, I don't want to be running her in around other coyotes. You know, I would prefer if we've got to get a bite to eat, we go in and get a bite to eat and we leave, but they're looking to pair up and to run her into another male could lead to a territorial dispute. Okay. So having other coyotes around isn't necessarily always a good thing, mm -hmm. depending on what the mindset is on those coyotes. If they are, if it's later in the breeding season where they're starting to square off a piece of dirt to say this is our turf and this is where we're going to dig our hole, at that time, uh, coyote vocalizations are clutch, you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you want to elicit a territorial response out of that home team to come in and drive you out. Mm -hmm. Um where they might have a curiosity if you just roll in there and kill a rabbit. It could be an owl. It could be a fox. It could be a barn cat. It could be a lot of things that maybe wouldn't be as apt to get them up off their feet as another coyote. Hmm. Um, but then when you play the sound of another coyote, I'm really careful also not to discriminate against anything. So, sure. Um, you know, likewise, if I'm going out there to call for fox, I don't want to lead off with coyote howl. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and if I'm going to call for coyotes, I maybe don't want to lead off with a group howl to try to get them to answer me back and figure out where they are. Mm -hmm. Because if it's a single out there or a young one or a young pair or a pair that has the female wounded or something or she ripped her foot out of a trap and she can't get around, get around as well and she's not as healthy, um, they're likely not going to want to fight a pack of coyotes to hold this piece of dirt and you'll likely run them off. And that might be enough to cause a pseudo territorial dispute to bump them off of that hill and push them someplace else mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so in that thought process for me to play a passive female coyote hollow when i roll in to introduce myself as a strange coyote i'm 
not intimidating to anything out there. And if it's breeding season, I'm going to elicit a response from a single male or a bachelor group. Or um, if there's a mated pair in there, they're not afraid of me as a solo. So okay. I'm more likely to draw them in and have them come push me out. Gotcha. Does something like that also allow you to kind of read the situation then? Like as far as if you do get a response, mm-hmm. you'll be able to tell like, okay, that's, you know, that sounds like an adult male or something like that, or it kind of lets you know what you're dealing with on the other side, and then you can adjust from there? Yep, it certainly does. And uh, especially up in in my area and further north um, and in other areas of the country where there's a wolf population as well, Mm -hmm. um, that will, and my use of vocalizations changes with that. So I want to boost the coyote's confidence throughout that whole calling stand that it's just coyotes out there. So, you know, if again, if I roll out and just blow that rabbit call, what's to say that a wolf isn't killing it? Or what's to say that a wolf isn't coming in to in- investigate it just like a coyote is? Does that coyote want to be the first one to the show or the last one to the show uh, if there's potentially wolves there? So I will utilize vocalizations in a different way in that area um, where I'm going to keep coyote vocals going for a lot of the stand or maybe some fox vocals for a lot of that stand to try to boost the confidence of that home team to say, yeah, there's there's not a wolf out there because a coyote's not going to stand its ground and face bark at a wolf. Right. It's just not. <laughs> so, you know, if I've got a coyote fight going on out there, I've got, you know, a, a coyote coming in to push another coyote off of a rabbit or a fawn or an adult deer distress sound or whatever, um, I try to keep those coyote vocals pretty constant throughout that sound so i'll be bouncing with my remote on my electronic caller back and forth between the recall button um you know playing a white tail distress and fighting coyotes and a white tail distress and fighting coyotes and some challenge barks and some aggressive face barks or challenge screams or whatever Mm -hmm. but throughout that whole stand it's evident to anybody with an earshot that there's not a wolf out there gotcha and even the sound selection of that passive female coyote I try to select, in wolf country, a very high-pitched female howl that is very easily going to be able to be picked apart from a okay. wolf howl, and, and the coyotes are not even going to have a doubt that that's a coyote. Hmm. So kind of putting yourself in their shoes, and are, are they going to want to come? Right. So, and maybe there's just, because there's so much to unpack there. Can you break down maybe like your top, like the top three coyote vocalizations top three four five i guess how many they are and like kind of when and how you would use them just to like kind of dissect yeah sound sure so i like my natural voice howl uh, of course but i i like that passive female howl um and the difference between a female and a male howl, as far as a rule of thumb goes, a male has typically got more gravel in it or more of a raspy sound. Okay. Um, and a female is going to be a little bit more clean and pure and hold, you know, a, a cleaner tone. Um, but that passive howl can be a part of a stand all by itself or it can be built into that scenario or a strange coyote rolls in on top of coyotes fighting or something and um it's maybe you know the way that i use it the most often i would say is to open a stand so it's a strange female coyote knocking on the door to say i want to slip down in this brushy draw and get myself a bite to eat but i don't want to get my butt kicked for doing it so i'm just going to feel the you know dip my toe in the water see if there's anybody home and that passive female howl is soft barks or just a howl by itself, but it's not um, its not staccato. It's not angry sounding. It's not mm. abrupt and sharp and okay. popping. Um, so that, again, I'm hoping to elicit a response from the home team, um, either physically coming in to push me out, coming in to be curious and inquisitive, um, or a challenge response to say, this is my turf, get out of here, that's my kitchen. Um, leave or I'm going to force you out or to get a coyote to answer me from a mile away or a mile and a half away on potentially a piece of ground I can get into as permission or public or whatever um, from a distance to say another passive howl back or another pair response back with a passive howls 
to say, hey, you know, we're home too, and it's just kind of a sounding off thing. So anybody that's been outside, been around the campfire, you know, heard a pack of coyotes light up over here and a pack of coyotes light up over here mm-hmm. and a pack of coyotes light up over here, um, it, it's kind of a roll call thing. Yeah. So with it, it helps to establish some of that territory um, where you're not going to have packs wanting to push so much into each other. They know who's home over there and who's home over there. Um, and that passive female coyote howl is really powerful to use on a calling stand because, again, it's not discriminating against any coyotes. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not intimidating by herself. It sets up that using that sound stimulus as a focal point for them to mm-hmm. know that that's where that passive female coyote howl ended up is on top of that rabbit or is on top of that woodpecker. So I don't use a lot of challenge howls in the same way that I've read or seen people use them um, when using vocalizations. A lot of the time, you know, as a response to that passive howl where I would get them to blow up with a challenge back, the home team 500 yards away in the draw saying, rah, get out of here, this is mine. I don't necessarily want to challenge them back. Oh. So a lot of this coyote psychology is posturing. So it's a pretty big risk versus reward thing for them to roll out into a fight because if they get bit in the nose, they can't smell well, or it's pussy or it's infected or whatever. Um, the first thing to go as far as reproductive or as, for, as far as fitness is reproduction. Mm-hmm. So if they aren't doing well, if it's a male that can't go out and gather food well or doesn't uh, carry himself well through the winter time, he's likely going to lose that female to another male that can beat him off there or mm-hmm. fight him off. So he's got to stay in really great shape. Um, if he gets bit in the foot in a fight or bit in the ear and that gets infected, um, you know, that can affect balance, that can affect their ability to hear and communicate and all that stuff. So there's a lot of pieces in this risk versus reward that if they can just blow up at you from the backside of a hill and get you to leave, they're going to do that. That's super interesting. Like you said, mm-hmm. it's like, I would have been like, oh man, this, you know, this thing, you know, is elicited an aggressive response that wants to fight. It's I'm going to come back. And in, in reality, it's like, oh no, I was just, uh, I was just uh, puffing my chest out. I didn't actually want to fight. Yeah. You can call their bluff and. Jeez, what are you crazy? <laughs> and, and get them to leave, um, which isn't what you want. So, yeah. and that's not to say that answering a challenge howl or answering an aggressive howl with an aggressive howl isn't going to kill coyotes because it, it, it will bring some of them in. Mm-hmm. And the most aggressive of those will come barreling right down into the call. Um, but if you walk into 25 bars looking for a fight, you might find one person out of those 25 bars in today's day and age that wants to fight with you. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you go in there as a really attractive young lady and all you're looking for is a drink, you can get that pretty easily in any one of those 30 bars. So... If Makes you throw sense. that passive howl to every coyote out there, whether they blow up at you or don't blow up at you or say, hey, hang on, sweetie, I'm coming, either way, all I have to do is kill something. Mm-hmm. And if the home team said, get out of here, and I didn't, I just waited a minute and killed something, and I'm standing on top of a rabbit in their kitchen now after they told me to leave, I've worked them up pretty bad. Mm-hmm. And if they didn't say anything and they want to come in and sneak in on me, and now I'm standing on top of a rabbit distracted, I've got them too. And if there's one from three quarters of a mile away that said, hang on, sweetie, I'm coming, he now knows where to come. Yeah. So, you know, those two things in conjunction, it doesn't have to be a rabbit. It could be zebra distress or walleye distress or whatever it is. Did you say it's, zebra? Yeah, just, it, it can be anything. Sturg- <laughs> sturgeon distress, whatever. <laughs> um, it's just a... Uh, wow. It's just a sound stimulus. Yeah. If there were a sound of rustling grass, that's all it would take. Hmm. Right. All, okay, it, yeah. all it is is a position. It's you know where you're drawing your X on the map. That's what you want them to circle off of. That's what that prey distress sound in my arsenal is used as. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Earlier, Matt, you were saying uh, you know oh you know coyote psychology and think like a coyote. The more we talk, though, I think really you could just think like a person, and <laughs> it's pretty much the same thing. It d- depends on depends on the situation, yeah. <laughs> but I, I draw. Yeah, I think a lot. of old re- fraternity row, right, Mark? Back in the days, good times, Jim. Is that what they call it? I don't know. I something like that. I don't know. But I, I try to draw a lot of analogies back to the anthropomorph- anthropomorphic side of things to help to 
mm-hmm. teach people with it. Um, so yeah, then another really powerful sound are coyote fights. Um, okay. Whether, and whether it's a, your pup distress sounds, um, or if it is a, a pup fight or an adult fight or whimpers, I use those aggressive sounds, um, a lot of the time in response to a challenge. So if, if I got the, if I got the home team to blow back at me and say, get out of here, um, and I go ahead and I kill a woodpecker and it takes me two minutes to kill a woodpecker and nothing comes. Now at that point, I want to up the ante a little bit. Mm-hmm. So I know I have their attention. I know that they're within earshot. They know what I'm doing. They know where I'm at, mm-hmm. but I haven't seen them yet. Or they're really apprehensive and they haven't broke cover or they haven't come over the top of the hill yet. Um, at that point, then I will stage a fight in front of them. Okay. So, yeah. Again, I'm not reaching out to them with a challenge. I'm staging a fight in front of them. Yeah, it's like you guys didn't come in to check this out. But yeah. somebody else did, and now we're in a scuffle. Exactly. Yeah. And now they're like, now there's all these coyotes in our kitchen. Right. Yep. yep. So to trigger that, you can do it any number of ways. You could just throw fight sounds in at that point, or you can throw that passive female howl again, answered by a challenge, and then break into a fight. Or if depending on what you've got for equipment with you, you can throw that uh, passive howl from your collar, answer it from where you're standing with a challenge, and then answer with a fight on the collar. So that creates more realism out there on the stand. Things are moving around. Um, if mm-hmm. they're within earshot, they're pretty easily able to pick that that came over from over there, that came from over there, and then that one flew in there, and now they're fighting here. Yeah, so they're, you can they're painting an image of, in their head of what they think is going on. And, yeah. Yep. Huh. And you said, uh, so you're doing, you're doing, too, a lot of the calls via just your own vocal cords, right? Mm-hmm. That was kind of an interesting thing. I, I know you mentioned where you said that you feel as though making a sound with vocal cord tissue is a bit more authentic than doing it with any number of different reeds or whatever, right? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I guess a good example of that, that passive female howl. I'll step this back. Hold on. I, I do want to point out, so uh, Jim, I was, I was, I've been teasing this part out, but, yes. but we're here now. And okay. I can't believe we're going on an hour right now because this is like I find all this so fascinating. But Matt, I want to I want to get into your resume a little bit here. So you're a two-time world predator calling champion. Yes, sir. Competing with your natural voice. Yes. And Matt, Matt. So anyway, so that's that's I'm setting the. But anything else we need to add in there, Matt? That's fine. Yeah. So that's like Pro Bowl wide receiver, and he never wore gloves. <laughs> <laughs> So if you're if you're only listening right now, this is actually happening with the human voice. Yes. So Matt, take take it away. Give us some All demonstrations right. here. All right. So uh, a passive female howl is again soft barks and a tone that isn't real aggressive. It's not abrupt. It's not popping, and it's your uh, kind of token at the bonfire here in the coyote howl or the cowboys sitting around the bonfire here in the coyote howl that's that kind of image but but it's soft it's not forced it's not okay. aggressive it's not really nasty um you know a, a contrast to that would be some more aggressive barks or howls. Oh, that distinct. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And those are sounds that you've heard out there. And it's pretty easy to distinguish that. And on stand, then, use that to understand how they're going to play it. Um, be Gosh, ready. So incredible. Be, be, <laughs> be ready for the aggressive ones to come over the top of the hill right after that, or a challenge scream um, is the most aggressive vocalization a coyote can make. It's kind of like a, I guess in in uh, the deer hunters world, a, a buck growl, right? Okay. Um, where they're so angry they're not barking and they're not howling. It's. <laughs> Yeah, 
If you hear Ooh. that, if you hear that, there's Mark's a, racing. There's a Mark's got goosebumps over here. Woo. There's a pretty fair shake that that's going to be one of your aggressive coyotes boiling over the top of the hill. Coming okay. At you. Okay. But you know, then with that too, there's you know these fight sounds I was talking about. You can really tug at a lot of heartstrings with the fight with the fight sounds. Um, utilizing pup distress or the fights in general and a lot of folks talk about you know after a shot playing pup distress and eliciting that mm. pack response to get them to try to come in and help their buddies out um, and being able to capitalize on a second or a third or a fourth or if a pair comes in and you take one and the other one boggers out you might get it to stop at 300 yards with pup distress or with okay. a fight okay yep um mm-hmm. so the pup distress sound or that that high pitched you know like you stepped on a dog's tail or you're slamming a dog's tail in the door or something like that um is a really sharp sound that carries for a long distance and will strike them immediately at something they understand sure um so the fight sounds depending on where you use them you want to be careful and again uh you know my natural voice fight stuff is kind of deep so i'm leery about using it all the time in wolf country unless i've got Mm. high-pitched coyote sounds to go along with it where i'm likely going to be boogering coyotes out thinking that there there might be something heavier than a coyote in there yeah so um you know again with that and i certainly encourage anybody out there listening or watching to try this stuff with your natural voice it's it's a muscle memory thing um you know i'm certainly very blessed and fortunate to be able to make the sounds that i can but they're not unattainable and whether it's a fawn distress or a rabbit distress if you're call freezes up in your pocket or your batteries die or whatever in your remote um it's good to be able to fall back on something else beyond that be it a diaphragm call or your natural voice and there's something a little bit more rewarding about calling in a calling in an animal with your natural voice too just to, just like to give uh, myself some hope what did it sound like when you very first ever tried to make these sounds with your voice was it just did, did it sound was it like 90 percent of the way there and you're like, oh yeah we, we can polish that a little bit or was it as awful as it would probably sound if i tried <laughs> i was off to a pretty good start all right well you're yeah. also pretty familiar with it i'm sure by the time you yeah. start doing it right you'd heard it yep. so many times uh, well and i think jim and matt and i were talking about this i think when we were talking about just even doing this podcast uh to begin with and he brought up you know the natural voice stuff and i mean i'm nowhere near matt level you know when it comes to making you know animal sounds but i do think a person might surprise themselves if you like you said if you know what those animals sound like and you actually and you try to recreate it i think you might be surprised at how hmm. accurate you can be or yeah. h- how you can get better like hmm. you said i mean we're animals too we've mm-hmm. got similar you know vocal cords and kind of built similarly and it's fair like yeah. Matt touched on, I mean, you're not going to get a more accurate sound than with those types of materials. That tissue. Right. Yeah. Well, and even, you know, falling back on your meh from before, that's not that far off. You know, yeah. realistically, you got your can or you got your dough bleat or you're hearing stones out there in the wild. It's not that far off. And yeah. what, what does it do? It locks your buck up for a second. Yeah. And all it needs to do is trick their ears. You don't, you don't need to impress Mark or impress me or whatever, or even impress yourself with it. All you got to do is trick a critter with it. That's a good point. And, you know, so I don't want to discourage anybody from getting out there and trying that stuff. And, you know, from little on running coon hounds and stuff, we were, um, you know, trying to get the puppies riled up and stuff with coon fight sounds. And we had little hand call squalls and stuff like that. Um, but to do them with your natural voice is a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. I've heard a coon fight before, and it's kind of one of the most blood curdling sounds ever. I can't imagine actually <laughs> making that with your voice, but well, I'll I'll try to stay more on the boar side of things without my diaphragm calling, but <laughs> and that okay. nasal sound coming back in is really indicative of coon fight, but you can't uh-huh. really do it on hand call. Right. And whereas with the the diaphragms or the the kai eyes that you're going to get on an open read call for coyote hunting, that are the yeep 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 kind of thing that people use. Um, that do work, practice, play around, and try to get to a point where you can create some fight sounds. And mm-hmm. things like that. My goodness. So 
every time. I believe the goosebumps, they come, they go oh, back, I know. and then he does another one, they come back. Well, it's, it's crazy. just like, it's shocking because, I mean, I've heard probably, you know, most coyote sounds in the wild, and uh, those are them. Like, that's it. Yeah. Like, that's the sound. Now, every time I hear him, I'm just going, oh, it's Matt over there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, I, stay out of my spots. Oh, I, I get around. I get around. <laughs> Man, um, that's that really something. Yeah, you probably you deserve some a good swig of water after some of those. That sounds like it would uh, it would dry out the throat. It's not as taxing as you'd think. That's good. I'd probably <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't know if I'd even be be able to hear my voice after that. You know, it, we, I don't. So number one, did we finish all kind of the main sounds there, or is there anything we leave something on the table uh, as, there? As far as vocalizations, I think that pretty well covers it. Okay. Um, and then again, you know, just be careful out there as you're using pair sounds and pack sounds because you you don't want to discriminate against a single coyote out there. Right. Mm-hmm. You want to be able to call in everything that's out there. Um, if you're just practicing shooting triples, then yeah, go ahead. But beyond that, I think we all want to see as many coyotes as we can possibly see. So just be careful in the sound selection and try to think about how it's going to strike those animals yeah. and mm-hmm. what the response might be to a single or to a young pair. Mm-hmm. Just real curious, though, real fast. Some of these distress sounds you're talking about, you also make those via your own voice, too, right? Yeah. So can you do zebra distress? No. I was, <laughs> I was kidding. Or walleye, uh, walleye or sturgeon walleye. distress. That's all Jim's yeah. been thinking about for the last 20 minutes. What is like walleye zebra. distress? Just... Yeah. Like flip, flopping yeah, yeah. around, little bubbly sound. Um, yeah, but you know, kind of tying back to those um, daytime calling stands and scenarios too. Before we get uh, too far out of time here, you want to do things to add realism in your calling. And one of the old things that's been tossed around a long time is throwing in some crow sounds. So, okay, for somebody mm-hmm. that's been out there daytime calling, or if it's out west, you're likely pulling magpies and things like that. But when you're out calling, you know, you're bringing in birds of prey and when we're nighttime calling we're bringing in owls like crazy all the time but you want to add some realism to those stands especially if you're out there you know outside of the you know, say the, the tournament hunting piece where you're really just running and gunning um you're out there for the enjoyment of it call in some crows yeah yeah have, have them over the top of you or just make the sounds um while you're while you're playing those rabbit calls or things to try to boost some of that realism and uh you know, crows are pretty sharp critters, and if you've got them tricked, if you've got them tricked, there's a decent chance you might trick a coyote with it too. Well, and that's oh. a pretty. Uh, not only do you have the audio, but I mean, you've got this beacon of crows above you for that visual cue as well. I mean, there's yeah. a lot going on to, like you said, Jim, paint that picture and get to give them the confidence to come in that they think that's the real deal. And if you learn the old crow call, it could help you during turkey season too, from what I've gathered. Well, this is true too. Um. So with I do have a fairly nasty crow call, but apart from that, oh, man. Um, turkeys. So wintertime coyote calling in the daylight. Turkeys have a hard time flying if they can't run. If the snow is deep, that's something that coyotes trigger and key on. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I didn't. I, I brought along uh, some decoys and stuff today to talk about a little bit too. But visual cues in the daylight can help. Um, but you don't want it in the middle of nothing out there you want to kind of set it next to something or you know, pet, kind of have it in a realistic spot one of the things that you can put out that is really easily identifiable and you know turkey hunting folks call coyotes in all the time mm-hmm. but beyond that even in the winter time if you've got a hen decoy out there playing turkey distress or even just by herself in the middle of that field not moving there's a decent chance that that's going to trigger a coyote response to come in and grab her mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. you know it's kind of outside the box type things but yeah they you know, just know the animals in your area and kind of what they what they key on, and and those kinds of things can can help you out a lot. Right? Yeah, that's. I, I mean, thought that, of that one. That's exactly what I was thinking too. Is like, okay, what lives by you? You know, what what's what's normal for that coyote to prey on? Like, what what is their diet in that area? We have mm-hmm. a lot of turkeys here, and Darns. I can definitely see that being a good sound. And I've called in coyotes mm-hmm. while turkey hunting. Yep. So, hmm. um, and um. Beyond that, too, don't be discouraged to try distress sounds from something that doesn't live by you. Okay. So to use snowshoe calls if you haven't got snowshoes by you, or to use jackrabbit calls if you don't have jackrabbits around you, it doesn't matter. Distress at some level is distress? Yeah. Yeah. Does that, do you think that helps, too? Like, you know, you know, everybody's got a rabbit call in their pocket and just throwing something different at them. They just haven't heard it before. 
To some extent, uh, you know, some folks talk about coyotes getting educated to, you know, a, a really common sound, you know, lightning jack in the Fox Pro libraries killed metric tons and tons and tons of coyotes. Right. Um, you know, a sound like that, that they see on TV and they know it works well, um, if, you know, that cadence and somebody going out there and pressing go for 45 minutes, if a coyote's sitting there watching that, they can get wise to those kinds of things. So, mm -hmm. you know, just try to make it as realistic as possible. Bring your sound levels up and down. And on, uh, you know, like on my electronic caller with Fox Pro, we've got Fox Motion, and we've got all kinds of things that'll automatically drop the sound for you so you can keep your attention on the field and not be worried about your remote and trying to make it sound realistic. Okay. Yeah. Or you can even set up whole sound sequences and, uh, and call sequences in there so you just hit play and watch the field. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. Um, lots of really neat neat features and then you know the decoy side of things too having it close to the sound stimulus is important um some movement and contrast against the backdrop and whether it's daytime or nighttime even uh, there there can be some use of decoys um and for things like fox and bobcat it's really important um to have some visual distraction in my opinion and from my calling experiences a lot of a lot of visual hunt there um, versus a coyote doing a lot of it with their nose. Mm -hmm. So typically on my run and gun type coyote scenarios, I'm not taking a decoy with me. Okay. But it can be a good asset for folks that are daytime calling or folks that are, you know, focusing on bobcats or, or on fox. And even at night, um, like the fox jack decoys have a, a light underneath them that shines up onto the decoy. So you see that contrast flicking through the light. Uh, prior to that, I used to take a headlamp and wrap it around my collar if I was using a decoy at night so that it would be flipping through that beam of light. Interesting. And be an attractant for them with that, that contrast of movement. Um, and, you know, the old timers for calling bobcats or calling fox or whatever would hang a feather off a stick or whatever right. and have that twirling around in the wind and it's movement. So that can certainly help. Um, and or coyote decoys on high ground. Yeah. So silhouetted you brought the some backdrop. of that stuff. Did you want to uh, pop yeah. it up here? Sure. Sure. Kind of go through some of your uh, your standard kit here. Mm -hmm. This looks like a well seasoned decoy here. He, he is, uh, and he doesn't have all his parts or pieces anymore. <laughs> um, no incidental gunshots, but you know this can just be stuck in the snow on high ground and okay. serve as that coyote, and can also be your your motion decoy or whatever you wanted to to use um on a post blowing around in the wind and things um but then some of the smaller pieces and I, like i said i don't have a fox jack with me but they've got some like red and black um and white decoy toppers and stuff that whip around mm -hmm. and spin in the light and uh can attach right to the collar run on the remote they really have thought of everything but they've got uh, a button for a pistol grip on an ar that you can hit to momentarily pause or set it up to run your decoy and okay. stop your decoy if you need to park the animal oh, or wow. whatever. So there's some pretty pretty cool stuff there. Um, and as far as uh, daytime equipment goes. Oh, yeah, let's check it out. Um, so you want to get, you know, something. This is a, a scout pack, but you can, um, you want to try to keep your stuff pretty well contained in the truck. Um this folds up into a nice little pack and rolls out into a backpack, depending on how you're using it or how you want to set it up. You can run your collar right out of the side of it if you want, but uh, but this is a, a CS24 um, I use for daytime calling now, but I've got an Arca Swiss plate locked on the back of it so I can set it on a tripod. It's really important to get your collars up off the ground. So mm -hmm. whether you're hanging in a tree branch or you're setting it on a fence post, that sound carries so much better when it's up off the ground. Oh, okay. Um, so whether you're using it on a tripod or however you choose to, um, some places where you set up, you don't have a tree branch to hang it on. So right. having a lightweight little tripod along with you is, is handy. Um, I've got some hand calls in here. We've got those now, Mark. I know. We've got a lightweight little carbon tripod. they got Arca Swiss plates on them and everything. Yeah. So here's the, the decoy topper. Okay. So you're getting some good contrast with that as it whips around back and forth through yeah. the light. Just mm -hmm. black and white, a little bit of red on there. Just yep. like you said, that's, that's about as contrasty as it can get. Yep. Yeah. Especially to uh, you know your a grassy, grassy environment out west. And then I've got a slew of hand calls, um, and you know you want to 
find one that works well for you and how you blow on them and um, and whether or not it's summertime hunting or if you got to worry about them freezing up um, those kinds of things can all can all play a factor in your your call selection diaphragm calls work great too um, what about volume Ooh, yeah. excellent question so there's a debate on that out there and again I'm not here to step on anybody's toes or tell them they're doing it right or wrong or anything of the sort um, some folks like to start their stand subtle and roll into a stand with mouse squeaks or vol squeaks and um, try to capitalize on that coyote that's laying 50 yards away from the collar that, ooh, mouse. Mm -hmm. um, and then also it should be said, the mouse squeaks are just kissing, can be heard for 400 yards by a wow, coyote. No way. Oh, yeah. Lock them right up out of a trot. Yep. How about that? And... Um, you know, so that's not a bad thing to start with. And typically, you know, when you're first getting settled in and trying to assess the landscape, if you didn't sit there for a half hour first and look at it all, um, you can start your calling stand with something slow like that, where those coyotes aren't likely to come barreling in to punch your call, come working in, poking around, yeah. um, that kind of thing. So it's not a bad deal, but that's also used as one of those coaxers to... You know, if you see them break cover, you've been calling really aggressively and hard, and they come up over the top of the hill, and they're looking for that coyote, or they're looking for that fox, or whatever it is they're coming in to beat on, just mouse squeak or kiss, or <laughs> kiss off the back of your hand or your fingers, or whatever you need to do, mm -hmm. um, to coax them in. And I use it quite a bit for fox calling, um, and I don't, in my area, typically go out for fox too often, mm -hmm. but um, I do call fox in fairly often. So a lot of the time I'll give them a pass. And um, in that, though, I will play with them a bit. And fox are like hungry barn cats compared to coyotes. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So those kisses like that, you can roll a fox into five yards fairly easily in a lot of areas. Um, but they, they're not hunted now like they used to be either. So they're getting a little bit more um, naive to some of that stuff, but fox are very aggressive to the call mm -hmm. compared mm -hmm. to a coyote in a lot of instances, gray fox especially. But uh, those kiss sounds are really dynamite for a lot of situations out there too. Um, but starting out with slow volume versus starting out with loud, uh, it's, it's a preference thing. Um, when I am on stand, typically for my leisure hunts, I'm out there for... 17 minutes 18 minutes things like that okay unless i'm working a coyote in so i keep things rolling pretty quick and pretty loud and pretty loud throughout the stand and very active um but you know if the the caller goes up to level 40 i'm going to open with a rabbit sound on 28 or thereabouts and that's okay. a pretty realistic sound uh, and it's also something that i can take way down to almost nothing if i'm getting them in close or trying to coax them in with that sound on um but when a rabbit is getting stretched by a coyote, it's loud. Right. And I can imagine. And it's realistic. I'd make some sounds if I was getting stretched by a large canine. Yeah. So those coyotes that are laid 50 yards, 50 yards away from the collar, you're likely still going to get them on their feet and still going to get them. Okay. Um, but it's just a matter of having them come in a little bit more relaxed and controllably. Um, and then, you know, throughout the stand, um, when, when I see them coming, I will typically drop the volume down if I'm running a distress sound or if I'm running a fight sound or post fight if I'm running coyote whimpers or something like that out there um, I'll take that sound level down mm -hmm. um, to a quarter or less of the maximum volume of the call and uh, it's all a matter of preference and like I said there's a thousand ways to do it um, don't be afraid to play loud but if you're playing a rabbit loud for 45 minutes, you know, on a loop, that potentially could lead to some call shy coyotes mm -hmm. further away, even. Yeah, um, yeah. So, uh, things to think about, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's all a matter of preference. What? Uh, I'm just gonna keep going here, Jim. I know we're, I know we're going long, keep but keep going, Marco. What? Uh, I've got like my list of questions here. Any, any weather patterns that you focus on? Like, is there a day where like maybe, maybe a weather event has happened, or maybe it's upcoming, and you're like, I need, I need to be out for this. Like, it's gonna be, it's gonna be on. Like, they're gonna be coming to the call. Yep. Um, so typically, what I see is after a storm. So like, if we have snow one night, 
Um, you might have really good action that next day. Um, the night action is typically going to be hotter the night after the storm. Mm-hmm. Um, and none of this is concrete. There's not anything absolute uh, that I would say is a positive correlation between weather patterns um, other than on the negative side. Um, whether daytime calling or nighttime calling, wind is huge. Okay. So they're comfortable in their area typically working under wind out of the prevailing direction. So that, on the surface, could potentially be a deterrent to get them up and moving if the wind is from a different direction and they're not used to using the terrain that way. Okay. Mm. Um, I wouldn't say that that's the strongest by any means, but wind speed is huge, very, very big, and whether it's consistent or switching. So if you've got a one to two mile an hour wind that's rolling... 270 degrees of the compass throughout the night those coyotes are likely not going to be terribly active okay and Mm. um or through the day also not going to be terribly active they like a good consistent true wind that when they get up off their feet to go make an approach or make a downwind circle that they're going to be able to get what they're going for um and if the wind is too strong same thing you know if it gets muddy out there while they're trying to pick up scent in the wind because it's hitting them in the face at 25 miles an hour there's a decent chance you're not going to call a lot of coyotes in. But all of those things are not absolutes. Mm-hmm. You know, If you set up right on top of a coyote and start calling, decent chance you're going to get them on their feet um, in the middle of a blizzard, in the middle of an ice storm, in the middle of pea soup fog like we had two weekends ago. Um, they were still moving. Okay, but interesting. But you had to be fairly close to them. It wasn't that they were going to come from a mile and a half away to get to you. You just sure. had to find, you know find places that they were and get on top of them. I mean, and that, that makes sense. You know, I, I can see a cop being like, eh, I'm not going to brave, you know, gutting this out for, you know, covering a mile, but I'll go 100 yards, mm-hmm. you know, or however long, yeah. however yeah. long that is. Um, yep. I mean, doesn't, you know, I mean, they're trying to conserve resources too. Like mm-hmm. them, they're, they're doing a cost benefit analysis every time they get up to it's eat reason. or fight or Same investigate that sound. Keep a beer fridge in your basement. You know, it's like you're watching TV in the basement. You're like, I'm not, I'm not feeling like walking up the stairs to <laughs> get. But there's a beer fridge in the basement, so I'll grab one of those. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Thanks for putting that into terms I can understand, Jim. Yeah, you got it. That's what I'm um, here for. Any specific habitats you really like, or does it just depend on where you are? Just depends where I am. Yeah. Um, the coyotes can scratch out a living wherever they're at and yeah. thrive. So, you know, when when we go out to hunt them, we've got to adapt to that but I wouldn't say there's anything necessarily that I prefer over over others. Um, it can be easier to harvest them in more open country than trying to hunt in big timber or mm-hmm. you know, things like that, but uh, it's not that it can't be done, and it's not that it doesn't provide for awesome calling to be in the big woods too. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah. I do like that aspect of the open country just because, you know, well, it's double-edged, like you said earlier. They can see you. Y- from a long ways you can see them from a long ways but man when you see that dog coming you're like oh man he seems pretty committed and, and then you really get to watch them use those terrain features and slip into that wash and you, i don't know yeah it, it's interesting to watch them I'm do their thing that. um any overlook spots and i don't want to give away all your trade secrets but is, is there a something that oh mark hey don't take my spot boardman is now <laughs> hey hey <laughs> I never said you're fine taking other people's spots. Yeah, I never said I'm immune to hypocrisy, Jim. Don't take my spot, but I'll sure take yours. (laughs) I have a strict policy with that. Um, as far as terrain features, or um, just like uh, I don't know, like if somebody rolled up to a spot and they're like, ah, there's no way there's coyotes in here. But little do they know, coyotes love it. Right, or, or you know, oh, there's a there's a, a farmhouse there, and and people are you know there's people around, and and there ne- there'd never be a coyote a hundred yards from that house or something like that. I don't know. Oh yeah, uh, so that that definitely occurs, um, and you know, abandoned farm buildings and things like that in the middle of the, that farm country. That's where mm-hmm. the mice are. That's where the rabbits are. That's where your disputes and that's where all of that stuff is going to go down. Okay. So, you know, don't be afraid to set up and call from in that okay and it's not to say that the coyote's not also in that cluster of buildings or in the driveway culvert yeah of those buildings or whatever um so yeah i mean they're they're using that terrain and as long as there's not a whole lot of human activity there um they're going to be pretty comfortable in that but then you know uh, beyond that even active farms active dairy farms 
chicken farms, you know, whatever, right off of the barns, right off of the buildings. You know, it's a terrain feature out there that you can use to break up your silhouette. Um, be careful about sound if you're standing next to steel s- siding and things like that when you're crunching around in the grass or mm-hmm. whatever. That's all amplified. Um, oh, yeah. But apart from that, um, you know, be courteous to the landowner if it's not your if it's not your place and don't be ripping off rifles 40 yards from their house. Um, but don't be don't be discouraged to set up in and around buildings mm-hmm. or you know manure pits or you know whatever that are out in the field and provide you with some silhouette backdrop and coyotes are are running around on them all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there was a coyote uh chasing my in-laws dog around their backyard. Oh one goodness, night. Jim. Mm-hmm. And if they're in the middle of a neighborhood in suburbia around mo- nearby Milwaukee. They can live anywhere. I Literally, mean, it was chasing him in circles around their backyard. Mm-hmm. I mean, you hear, you do hear accounts of, you know, like it'll be, you know, downtown California, you know, early in the early hours of the morning. And pilots are, you know, going through trash cans and, you know, living that city life, I guess. But Collecting cats. Collecting cats, yes. Mm-hmm. That's uh, a cat yeah, collector. That's probably a good sound, actually, on the old uh, on the old Fox Pro there. Yeah. What uh, God, distress sounds? What, give me your top five distress sounds. Oh, lucky. Maybe it's too hard to choose. It it is, um, but I will give you a good a good array. So um, I like um, on the Fox Pro library. I like Lucky Bird. Um, I like my own natural voice cottontail. Right. My natural voice jackrabbit. Um, and their lightning jack, their baby cottontails. And there, there's so many of them. And one thing that I would I would say as it pertains to those prey distress sounds, and in, in my experience I've seen the animals respond better, more aggressively, or they're gripped better by faster High pitched moving sounds. Okay. So, um, or high pitched faster moving sounds, I should say. Um, and then even even with calling cats and fox and things, if you're running, um, you know, a, a baby cottontail sound or a woodpecker distress or something like that, um, I will even go so far as to go into my menu options on the caller and jack the pitch up on that call to oh. make it higher pitched. Hmm. Okay. Get it to carry on a different frequency. Um, but I like those fast moving sounds and it's not that you won't call them in on a, a fawn ball or a calf ball or, um, you know, a snowshoe wailing out there, mm-hmm. but some of those faster moving, even shaking sounds where that, that coyote's got the rabbit and it's wee, 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 ah, where mm-hmm. it's getting shook that right. can add a lot of realism to it. Um, and you know, I, I look for that kind of stuff in, in the sounds, if, yeah. that, if that helps. But there's so many out there. We're, uh, we're kind of, I think, uh, or you'd probably know better than I do. I'm trying to remember back to my Nebraska days. But calving season mm-hmm. is kind of a big thing, and I think that kind of happens spring-ish. Is that something a person can key on? I mean, are those, are those coyotes going to be more apt to be kind of, uh, I guess, uh, circling, the, circling about. the wagons, if you will? Looking for scraps. Yeah, and uh, and or they might just they might be hassling calves, and that's why you got the call. Uh, or they might be you know flanking them, and they end up dying on the guy two days later or something like that. So okay, um, you know there is a fair bit of calf mortality that occurs due to coyotes, um, and in and around that setting, um, playing calf distress is probably not smart for you to do. Um, well, okay. it makes sense because you're out there going after calf killers. You've got calf mothers in that pr- in that area too that might come pushing through the fence. Yeah, uh, mom, mama g- calf might uh, yeah. take that oh. a little serious to get to you. So you got to think about that stuff. Not a little mama bit calf, mama calf. <laughs> before you, <laughs> right? I, I knew where you were going, but but you know before you set up and, and start playing sounds like that because it makes sense on its face. It May, right. It may not be. Yeah, you have thing. to think about all the animals that are out there, not <laughs> yeah. just yeah. in in theory, maybe not in practice. Yeah. Um, and you'll still kill calf killers with bull squeaks and woodpecker distress and other coyote sounds and all of that stuff, and not have to worry about pulling Angus through the fence and trying to get him caught before you leave. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Like, hey, uh, we killed uh, we killed a coyote, but uh, the one ran through the fence, and the rest of them, you may want to go get those. Um, <laughs> 
what about the, I think this might be my last one. Send but it. but you were talking about earlier, like you know, not using, or like if you're in wolf country, uh, you know, trying to make sounds that the coyotes know. Um, I know this isn't a wolf, and what's what's that hierarchy as far as like where you're having overlap of wolves, coyotes, foxes. Um, how are they sorting that out? And and are there things, other things that you need to take into consideration there? Like if you're seeing a ton of foxes, are there no coyotes? If you're seeing a ton of coyotes, are there no foxes? If there's wolves, are there, is there, you know, what's going on there? Great question. So um, wolves and coyotes don't typically get along really well, but a lot of that's seasonal too. So around, um, you know, pupping time and thing like, things like that where they've got their loafing area, they want to make sure there's no other canine presence in the area. And that's what leads to the downfall of a lot of bear hounds and things like that too is there another canine presence in, in that okay. area while they're trying to rid their pups. Um, you know, so there's some dispute then between coyotes and wolves. And um, coyotes and fox are a pretty, you know, age-old you know, discussion where if you've got a lot of fox, you might not have a lot of coyotes because coyotes and fox don't get along very well, and that's another canine presence, and coyotes like to kill fox and that kind of thing. Um, coyotes and reds don't get along well. Coyotes and grays, you'll see cohabitat more often than, than coyotes and reds hmm. because grays can climb and reds can't. <laughs> okay. So it's not that they necessarily are getting along, it's just the grays can get away. Correct. Okay. So, you know, when a coyote rolls up on a gray... It, you know, they know the first tree they chase them past, show it over. It was fun for the minute, but now it's done. Okay. Yeah. But if they roll up on a red, they can it's on. chase it and chase it and chase it and chase it or chase it into a hole or whatever, or call their buddies in to help them with it or whatever. But, um, so yeah, uh, reds and coyotes, you know, don't get along well. And that's something that I will key on sometimes in my calling, uh, too. Uh, so something to think about, but the uh to you know to say that absolutely if there's a lot of reds there's not a lot of coyotes there's not a lot of positive correlation that you can draw with that absolutely and i've i've seen the same on on stands i've harvested a red fox and harvested coyotes on the same stand okay. i've harvested coyotes and kept calling and pulled red fox in on the same stand after coyote fights and i've brought red fox in on coyote fights just coming in out of curiosity to the fight and um you know, the, the last place in the world that a red fox should show up is a coyote fight. Um, <laughs> Just one to see. <laughs> yeah, it's like a car accident. You know, they can't look away. But um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting dynamic out there, but I would say there's not a whole lot of really strong positive correlation to draw. But you can make inferences that if you're trying to boost a fox population in the area, eliminate a lot of your coyotes, it'll help. Okay. Right Interesting. On. Yeah, I was just kind of curious about that mm-hmm. kind of like pecking order, I guess, if you will. Yeah. So, cool, man. Good stuff. I think uh, I think uh, the chamber's empty, Jim. Well, that's go and, go and click. <laughs> you, this, it was amazing talking to you, though, Matt, about this stuff. And uh, I think it actually, I think, should give us a lot of good intel going into our own hunt. Oh, here. I can tell you unequivocally, I'll be a better coyote hunter after this conversation yeah so thank you so much i certainly appreciate that and i really appreciate the opportunity thank you guys for having me awesome well thanks everybody for listening as usual stay tuned because uh now mark and i actually have to go out and do this thing um so we'll see how that goes and uh yeah but we'll uh see you shortly on the next one thanks thanks everybody bye, bye. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.